This is Situate State of Affairs discussing local government issues and town news. And there's no doubt the chatter around town in the coming months will be about a new elementary school combining Cushing and Hatherley into one. But there's another school building project on the horizon, another multi-million dollar school building that will have a direct impact on Situate residents and more importantly, Situate taxpayers. That school, South Shore Regional Vocational Technical High School, better known as South Shore Votech or South Shore Tech. The school is located in Hanover and educates about 670 students. The school serves nine districts, Abington, Cohasset, Hanover, Hanson, Norwell, Rockland, Situate, Whitman, with Marshfield planning to join in July of next year. Each district holds a stake in the school, including the cost. The percentage is determined by enrollment. Situate share is 6.5%, meaning whatever the cost of a new school, Situate taxpayers will be responsible for 6.5% of it. May seem low until you hear the price. So what's the plan? Why the need and what's the cost? Tom Hickey is the superintendent of South Shore Votech. Superintendent Hickey, thank you for being here. Very, uh, very much looking forward to this interview. Two reasons. One, I think you're an outstanding public speaker. I've seen you in multiple meetings. Oh, jeez. You handle everything, Clat. You're direct, uh, precise. It's amazing. And number two is, I am fascinated to see how you plan to navigate this this uphill battle, and it's it's not even a hill, it's a mountain, frankly, <laughs> especially here in Situate, as you have the distraction of this other elementary school that voters are really focusing on, and you're like the kid in the back of the classroom raising your hand being like, wait, I, I, don't forget about me. So it's gonna be fascinating. Uh, look, I'm gonna help you as best I can here to get the information out there. We're gonna talk about the building, we're gonna show designs, we're gonna talk about the cost, but let's start with you. 30 years, South Shore Tech, 13 as the superintendent, you started in 2011. That's right. So talk, why, why are you so dedicated, what the, why are you so passionate about the school? Oh my goodness, this is, um, what, what an opportunity for me to have several roles in the same location. It's, it's almost unheard of. So yeah, I started as an English and history teacher in 1994 and served, uh, enjoyed that very much, served as a curriculum director and principal, and as you said, Seth, uh, I've been superintendent uh, since 2011. I can tell you that having spent nearly my entire career at one school, every year is different. And what I love about the job I have is that I get to see, I get to see it in action. I get to see the kids in action every day. I get to see the growth from when they come in in grade nine, not knowing what their technical major is going to be, all the way to them being placed as co-op students in grade 12. So if, if I ever have any doubt about uh, about the value of vocational education. I don't have to do anything more than go outside my office and, and, and see it happening. And I've, and I've been fortunate to work with, uh, when I was a teacher, with students from Situate and, and certainly as an administrator working with the, with, with the town of Situate uh, for many years. And the, and the town, I must say, has been, uh, has been very supportive. And support isn't just money. It's also uh, signaling that the town values its investment. Every year, we get an opportunity to go into Gates and make a presentation to all seventh and eighth graders about that other public high school down the street that not a majority of situate kids go to. So the town, the school department, has made it very clear for a very long time that the town of Situate, back in, back in 1960, decided to be part of the second regional vocational school in Massachusetts. Uh, they value it. And to this day, I can say that we have access to be able to explain what we're all about. And we're not for everyone, but I feel confident that folks in Situate know that if they, if they want their child to pursue this pathway, the school department is a great partner with us. I've visited your school. I've seen your students in action. I've also seen them in action at Situate High School where they built this <laughs> massive, alter, it's almost like a garage, of yes. a storage garage for the Center for Performing Arts. Every time I see them, I feel this slight vein of jealousy because the skills they're learning will never not be needed. There will always be a demand for it. And if these students learn these, they learn their craft, I'm like, they're, they're set for life. They're set for life if they want to pursue that. They're set for life because they have learned, perhaps for the first time, that if they are competent in something, that confidence stays with them. 
I didn't know something, I didn't know how to do something, I can go by that shed and say, I built that, I was part of that, I, I, made, I left something better than I found it. They carry that confidence with them. They may not stay in that career field, but that is, that is absolutely true, Seth. They, they, that is the intangible that they keep with them. And yes, they can, and, and for that carpentry student who feels confident being the go-to person for their family for the next 30 years, Maybe that's a blessing and a curse, but you can't take it away from them. And uh, when I talk to graduates uh, who have graduated in whatever decade, uh, the, the, that, that commentary is the same, that South Shore Tech has been a positive building block in whatever the 20, 30, or 40-year-old person is doing currently. I'm glad that we are a part of, of their of their current success. Your school was chartered in 1959, opened 1962. Yes. Now you want to build a new school. Why? Age? That's the big part of it. We, um, as, as folks in situ would know from past building projects, going through the Mass School Building Authority is a time-consuming process. But it's worth the wait because they're going to they're gonna pay for a chunk of it. And it's very burdensome on local taxpayers if a town or region were to go about it totally on, uh, under the local levy or, or, or whatnot. So you've got you to go through the process and wait your turn and make the argument and make the case. We were applying since 2015, making the case that our original school was built in 1962. We've done additions since then, but it's not up to code. Uh, and more than, I'm going to say more than that, but equal to that, is the fact that we're unable to meet the demand from our region. We enroll 175 to 180 freshmen each year. We have an average waiting list of about 68 students. The MSBA's goal is not to build a school so cavernous that we won't have a waiting list. We've got to make a decision for the next 50 years so that we're not coming back to our communities with big capital maintenance projects to sustain what we have. So the bottom line answer is we, we have to modernize the building. We have to make a better experience for the kids we have. And the MSBA did acknowledge that because of our waiting list, they allowed us to study enrollments that were higher than what we have now. You have a timeline on your website. The website, I'm sorry, South Shore, South Shore Tech Project com. Correct. There are a number of dates on there. I encourage people to go look at them. I don't want to go through all of them. If all goes as planned, this could come between uh, before situate voters along with the other districts that you serve, J uh, uh, January 2025, correct? You're, you're right. Before we get to that date, though, you have a very important date next month, January, January <laughs> 17th, yes. correct? And you have to make two, dis you're going be uh, before the MSBA, which stands for the Massachusetts School Building Authority, right? and you have to present two things. One is the design, we're going to show those designs in a second. The second, though, element you have to pre uh, present is your preferred enrollment. That's right. So why I, is that important? Well, I appreciate you doing your 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 homework on this, Seth, because there are a lot of dates and there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, processes we have to follow. So in G on January 17th, our school building committee will make those decisions that you mentioned, and then there's additional work that needs to be done. And we would we would be for if it goes to plan we would be in front of the MSBA probably in the summer. And I won't get into the alphabet soup of the various reports that have to be submitted. But we, as a local building committee, have to make that decision. And d the design options include an ad reno and two new designs. And the MSBA allowed us to study a range of enrollments. They said, first, you got to study a baseline of 645. That's a little bit less than we have right now. All the way up to potentially 975. And they knew that Marshfield, a year ago at the time, it wasn't a guarantee. So they said, we hear that Marshfield might be joining. Uh, so if Marshfield joins, you can study a wider enrollment. So where the building committee has landed is, we have eliminated some of the options, uh, the design enrollments, rather. We've eliminated 975 for projected cost reasons and because we're not sure that the site, the limited site on Webster Street, could sustain the operating costs, the parking spaces, et cetera. So we eliminated the largest enrollment, and we eliminated the two smaller ones. And so now we're studying an enrollment of 805 or 900. And that's, and that's ultimately uh, why January 17th, our, our project team, our project manager and our architect, uh, their homework assignment from mid-December to mid-January is go to their estimators, 
double check the numbers, and come back to us. We can't make an educated decision as a building committee until we can say, here's the cost. I ne our committee members need to know the cost difference between the designs themselves and also to compare with between the two enrollments. That's, that's our, that we have our work cut out for us, but we've waited a long time to, to tackle it. And we're going to show those designs. I think people like looking at pictures. Uh, keeps them interested, but I think here in Situate, with the limited number of students that we have attending South Shore Tech, the main interest is going to be about cost. As it should be. <laughs> so what's the cost? So there are a couple of ways to answer that at this stage. You and I are having this conversation in, uh, in mid-December. If we were chatting uh, in early 24, I'd come back to you with revised numbers. So our project team uh, did some initial analysis based off of square footage. And the, the cost estimates are very high. Uh, they're very high at a per square foot level. I've had a difficult time with this question because I know that within a month these numbers won't matter. But for situate uh, residents, uh, we, we apportion each town's debt share based on their last three years of enrollment. Uh, situate clocks in at about 6.6%. So if I were giving broad numbers off the top of my head, I would say we're looking at projects in the $350 million range. We're looking at about $100 million potential reimbursement. That drops $250 million or so to the, to the local level. Situate's share of these inflated numbers would be between 15.8 uh, to 16.8 million. As soon as I say it, I, I'll, I'll end with the same disclaimer. Those numbers are too high. They're not, it's not me saying, oh, cut, trim the fat. We haven't even gotten there. It's that they're not basing these estimates yet on an actual design. What they're trying to give us is some information that lets us say, is an ad reno which you preserve part of the building, one would think that's going to be cheaper than something that's brand new. But this allowed us to say, their analysis showed that the ad reno option that we're required to look at is, is in some cases more expensive than something that's new. And anyone that's been involved with school building projects probably knows that oftentimes that's the case, to bring a building up to code. Uh, to take on costs like modular classrooms. Our estimators were saying something like, it would cost us $10 million to rent, lease modular classrooms for four years, and none of that is reimbursable. Because that's the, that's the name of the game with MSBA. It's not about the percentage reimbursement. It's how much are you actually going to get reimbursed? How much of your, con of your construction project isn't reimbursable? So I, 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 I may have mentioned you know, when, when we were preparing for this conversation that the standard gymnasium size in a high school is 12,000 square feet. If we as a school district wanted a gymnasium that was bigger, what the MSBA would say is, we're going to reimburse you a portion of that up to a certain point, 12,000 square feet. You want more? You're going to have to pay for it on your own. So each school project, no matter what community it's in, uh, they have to take a look at those additional costs. So it, but, if, but if everything stopped right now, these inflated numbers, the big number, the reimbursement, situate six, the 6.6 6 part is, is something I can say with confidence because that's based on our regional agreement. What I'd like to say is that all of the numbers that I mentioned, the, the largest estimate, that would come down. The reimbursement amount, that 100 million I described, that would probably stay the same. That's about 30%. That's not a very large number. Vocational schools are more expensive to build because of the specialized space we have. We're trying to encourage the MSBA to consider increasing their reimbursement rates. Uh, but in any event, what I'm going to be very happy about is that these numbers will reduce. We'll be able to then look at them with the same clear math and say, whatever the number is, back out the reimbursement, what's 6.6%, and that's the share. Where we go from there, as you know, Seth, involves multiple steps, but it eventually translates into what is it going to impact me? How is it going to impact me as a taxpayer? And I, I'm a taxpayer. I live in, I live in the district. Uh, so I'm ask, I, I would be asking that question myself. Um, but you know as well as I do from projects that how you finance the project matters. That's downstream. We still have to come up with a preferred design, go to the MSBA and let them say, all right, we're going to advance you to the next round of the playoffs. Here's how much we're going to reimburse you. And then from the summer of 24 until January of 25, that's when we go back to our voters 
in our nine communities uh, and make the case for why this is important. So we can sort of say, maybe for situate taxpayers, we're looking at about 15 million ish, I, and it could vary. We know this, but if that's I sort think of you, a good I, I think start. that's reasonable. I and, think that's reasonable. And right now, we have 54 students from situate that attend your yeah, school. We've seen an upward trend. Yeah, two years ago it was 30. Now it's 54. Right. I I don't attribute that to anything right or wrong about yeah. what anyone's doing. These numbers can be cyclical. They could drop by 10 in a year. There's, right. there's no telling. And so I'll ask this question knowing some people may take issue with the way I phrase it. Okay. Uh, but I've been to enough town meetings that I know situate taxpayers can be very direct and blunt. So if a situate resident stands up and says, you expect us to spend 15 million on four dozen students, how do you respond? I would say it's, at the, at the very least, it's four dozen students uh, over the next half century, so it's not li it's not limited to that to that number. Um, I would say it's in keeping, uh, although although it is an expensive number, it's in keeping with the town's commitment to public education to vocational education. What our communities need to know, they need to feel, and those who are paying attention early, uh, who will want to keep an eye on things as they should. They want to know that we are bringing a very practical mindset to this project. We are not looking for an over-the-top school. What is it about our school, this new design that we can get into the designs? We need to make sure we're maximizing the space for our shop areas, period. Our shops are too small. I have four kids on a lift on a car and automotive. I have carpentry and electrical students who we need them to work outside of their shops because I don't have enough space inside. So we are bringing in students. The teachers are doing a phenomenal job. The economy is good. We've got so many great co-op employers. That's another piece, Seth, that, that we have to factor in for the future. There isn't always going to be a strong economy. There isn't always. I've got over 100 students who are out on co-op in our senior class. That's a senior class of like 155. So, there's, there's a huge number of kids who have the skill set to go out and work. Now, what does, that, what does that mean? It means that if all of a sudden the economy dried up and if the co-op numbers dropped, we would be under a lot of pressure to say, how are we going to be able to teach the kids if they're all inside the building all the time? Well, it wouldn't have an overnight negative impact, but it might influence the number of children that we can take in in, in ninth grade. So, so to me, I, I see it as it is, it is a longer, it's a longer term investment. And it's, um, it's also something that while it's not the primary reason, one of the things that I would expect, and we've, we've attempted to do this, we've been very successful with some state grants, is that ours is the school that does not shut down at 3 o'clock. Because our mission demands that we shouldn't, that we should continue to be a partner with our workforce development boards and we should get, and we should, and we're, we're several years beyond the pandemic to be able to be running, you know, a, a robust night school program. So it's an, it, it is a, a bigger investment, but our primary mission, of course, is for, for high school students. But we're filling the school at night right now with underemployed and unemployed adults who want to get into some of these skilled trades. So there's, there's a big investment here. Fantastic. There's no doubt about it. it. I think it's worth it. We've got to make the case. Let's get to designs. Yeah. All right. Sure. So we, let's look at the, uh, the, fr the current one. So you have, once again, three designs we're going to talk about yep. here. Two, the new, and then the one is the reno. Let's start just with a look at the school now. Sure. And then just to give people an overview, what, just walk us through what we're looking at, meaning the currently aerial of, of this image. Okay. So if, you're looking at, if we're looking at the, our current school right current. now, you'll notice that it's a sprawling ranch. It's about 130,000 square feet. Uh, our shops are generally in the center to the right of the building, and our academic classrooms are, are on the left and in the center of the building. We have an 8,000 square foot gymnasium, a very modest cafeteria. Uh, we have a modular unit that includes a few classrooms that, you know, modulars, they're supposed to be temporary. Well, ours was installed in 2000, and uh, I can't wait to see that go as part of whatever comes next. But uh, essentially, one of the fundamental things that will change in any of the designs we talk about today is that we cannot increase our enrollment and remain on a single floor. It'll be a new experience for us to have to walk upstairs uh, or maybe use an elevator, but all of these designs we're going to talk about 
have uh, have three floors. And let's start with the, the first of the new designs, new building. And one of the things I, I, I pointed out to you when I saw this is I was confused. I'm like, it looks like it's upside down. <laughs> you're, you're, right. you're reversing everything. Yes. So when you look at the when you look at the images, uh, whatever image you're able to show, the top of the image is Webster Street, Route 123. And folks who drive by our school know that right now we've got a nice area that our horticulture department takes care of. We've got some parking, school, and the ball fields in the back. We are reversing it. We're, we're on a limited site. We're surrounded by wetlands. Uh, our project team has been very good about you know, acknowledging that and not over-promising uh, what we can build. But we have concluded that we could build a new school on our baseball and football field in the back, which is at the bottom of the slide. And then eventually, where our current building is now, that would essentially be the center of the property, which is where most of the parking in the various schemes would be. And then our, our fields would be in the front. We are, the, our next homework assignment right now is to decide on what's the front going to look like. We've got to make a conscious decision about are we going to have a are we going to have a multi-purpose synthetic field, which I think we need to, given, given the demands that we have? Uh, all of our fields right now are, are natural, but the wear and tear, I think, you know, warrants it. But we're looking at things like putting a, putting a proper track. We may not be able to put a track around the multi-purpose field. We need to decide whether we can have separate baseball and softball fields. Right now, our softball field is actually uh, it. it <laughs> We can't have a softball game and a lacrosse game at the same time in the spring on our current site. But on these other designs, our, our architects and our landscape architects are able to show that there's a trade-off. And I think, Seth, where this conversation that we're going to have as a building committee will go is, if we can fit everything, a multi-purpose field for soccer and football and lacrosse with a track, and if we can also fit a separate baseball and softball field, which will be practice fields in the fall, <laughs> then we're probably going to have less parking. And if we have less parking, we're going to have to pressure test that and say, OK, if you're going to go with a bigger school, let's not forget that there'll be increased operating costs. You have to hire more staff. And they're going to drive to work. And where are they going to park? And then are you going to be left with too few student spots? I get it. Students can take a school bus. That is absolutely true. But you can imagine that as a regional school, with kids coming from the ocean, <laughs> all the all the way into uh, to Brockton almost that kids are driving more than a few minutes to get to school so we have to we're going to have to figure out over the you know we'll, we're going to make an initial decision and then we're going to have to take a look and see what can we really fit so that while you and I talk design the building of course is that's where a lot of the attention goes but the site design for us we don't have the I guess say the luxury of saying yep put the parking over here put the fields over here we, one decision will influence another very, very clearly. That's what we're working on this month. And the, and the second design, how is the second new design different from the first? So, so in terms of the, I'll, 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 fl I'll go back to the, the building design. So, yes. so the first building design, regardless of what we do on those fields, the only difference between the first design, which we call 2.0, and the other new design that we're calling 2.1, is the location of the gym, auditorium, and the dining commons. In Design 2.0, those public areas, the commons, the gym, and the auditorium, are, if you're looking down at the image, they're on the right side of the image. What we've been talking about is whether or not, whether or not we would want those items to be in the center, the geographic center of the school. And that's what Design 2.1 is. We simply have taken, it's the same it's the same concept. First floor is mostly shops that require a high bay. Do we move those public areas to the center? Now, there are some administrative reasons that this might be of value. One is kids have a shorter distance to get to lunch. It's also an opportunity for us to be able to gather students in the center of the building. So aesthetically, we're looking at having the dining commons, having an area for people to gather in the, in the middle. But we're also looking at practical things such as, what are the athletes going to do? Like, where's the locker room? And do we want football players with cleats coming through the center of the school? Because as you pointed out, the fields are in the front. So these, these, are, not, um, these are not all educational decisions. But they're practical, because that impacts long-term maintenance. So literally right now, Seth, what we're looking at, we're, we're going to forward both of these designs to the estimators. 
the, the 2.0 and the 2.1 in the ad reno. But right now our building committee is that, that where I anticipate us, when we get those cost estimates back, our building committee is looking at that saying, okay, do you want it at the end or do you want it in the middle? The good news is that these designs are so similar that we, we've all agreed that we want something that's simple. We want something that's easy to supervise. I like having a center. It's not a, it's not a, a straight line. It's a slight bend, but it's not a courtyard. It's a center hallway. I like having it be a focus on shops on the first floor and then stacking your science labs and, and your classrooms and a few of our low bay shops. I like the fact, and I have to add this now, that in these new designs and in the ad reno, we're adding two new programs. If we pull this project off, we're going to have a plumbing program and we're going to have a veterinary science program. Why those two? Both of them are economically viable. You can't open a, a, a vocational program if there is no college or workforce pathway. That checks both of the boxes. Plumbing is a program that I've heard for 30 years people say, I can't believe you guys don't have a plumbing program. Uh, this is our opportunity to add one. And I think it will, uh, I think it's a no-brainer. The veterinary science option is interesting because we look at it in two ways. One is, it's an opportunity to offer our families a program that is a traditionally female program when you look at it statewide. But if a child in our region in northern Plymouth County wanted this program, they would have to go out of district to Norfolk Aggie in Walpole to get, to get this program. We're all, and, and so the, the gender, the reason I bring up the gender-based uh, idea with veterinary science is that if we're a district that's about 50% male, female, our school enrollment is about 63% male. So I've got to look honestly and say we've got one opportunity to expand programming. Are there any economically viable programs that could draw students who might otherwise only have an option to get on a bus to go to the Aggie? That's where we ended up with veterinary science. We had considered others. So whatever we, if we're able to pull something off, we will go from 12 vocational majors up to 14, and I think we'll fill them. Fantastic. Yeah. Final question. This goes to the voters. It fails. Yes. Then what? So the MSBA allows districts an opportunity to get another crack at it, but it's generally something that um, it's, it's not like a life. You don't get another, you don't get several years to do it. So let, if it does fail and the message is sent and oh, this isn't going to work, well, then we probably have to focus on where we were in 2021. In 2021, in, in, in the <laughs> leading, leading into us getting invited, we went to our eight towns and we said, look, we have done as much as we can do through our annual assessments. And we went to our eight towns uh, in 21 and we said, we'd like you to authorize us to borrow some money because the capital improvements we need to make to our school are unaffordable, and we could not ask our towns to fit them in as part of our annual assessment. So if all of a sudden we needed a roof and we didn't go through an MSBA project, how do we take a $20 million roof and divvy it up amongst our towns and ask them to pay for it in one year? No financial person would say that's a wise move. It's a budget buster. So what do you do? You borrow. So we got all of our communities to support us doing that. And that was after six years of being told no by the MSBA. We had to prepare for this. Our community said yes. Within less than a year, I don't know if it's Murphy's Law, whatever, MSBA invites us in. And I remember going to communities like Situate saying, I hope you'll support uh, this modest bar. It was 10.5 million we ended up at. Uh, I said, but if MSBA invites us in, we're calling a timeout because we're not going to have our local taxpayers pay 100% of a capital cost if we can be patient and wait for MSBA. If this were to fail, uh, then we'd have to go back to that approach and say, all right, what's, what are the next big capital projects we have to take on? And, you, and people who follow building projects know that if the MSBA doesn't subsidize it, it's all on the local level. It's all, you know, so what would be one thing we would tackle? Um, our 1962 building is not sprinkled. That's, you know, so, so that would be one of the first things we'd have to do. We'd pay 100% out of pocket to sprinkle the building. 
and I, I, I could go on and on. But I've been fortunate in the last, since getting invited to MSBA, when I'm doing this long range capital planning that we do, my focus now has been on equipment. Now when I say I have a 1992 roof that we're not going to replace, we're going to MacGyver that roof until we can get MSBA to pay for some of it, uh, we'd, have to go, we'd have to go back to those we'd have to go back to those bigger expenses um, and probably go back to our communities asking for some sort of borrowing. So, Is it fair to say this is the, the biggest project you've, you're, you've had to tackle in the past oh, 30 it, years? Oh, there have been a lot of smaller projects. Yes, it's, a, but, is. But what is, it's absolutely the biggest, but the fundamentals are the same. You have to explain, you have to be transparent, you have to talk early and often. People care. Even if we run a public forum and one person shows up, it doesn't mean people don't care. Sometimes folks have got a lot going on and they're going to tune in in the fourth quarter. And we have to be prepared all through this process to raise awareness, to listen for feedback, and be prepared to make adjustments. But numbers wise, oh yeah, it's the biggest. It's, it, it's, it's very big. Now us bringing in Marshfield is an important factor, Seth, if, I, if you don't mind me just looping back Absolutely. to Marshfield. Marshfield is coming into our district knowing that they are going to take on a share of the debt. And so what I've casually said to folks is that there's a coupon. Like when like if you go to Kohl's and and, and you're gonna buy some clothes and they have this, you know, they have a they have a coupon where you get so much off, but you gotta scratch it off to see what, what's your discount. That's how I'm feeling right now, because I don't know what that, that that discount is going to be. But the way Marshfield worked, the way that we worked it with Marshfield is you come on in. We track your enrollment from fiscal 26 through 29, four years. We see what your enrollment is in, in fiscal 29 as we're preparing the fiscal 30 budget. Why is this important? Because whatever their enrollment is, let's say it's 10% of the building, the, that would then translate into a, a haircut of 10% for all our communities. But because I can't promise it, I can only suggest it. When we go to those voters in January of 25, we won't know what it is. What we, can, what we can safely assume is that it won't be as high as we're projecting, but since it's not a guarantee, I, I, I just say it as a, it's promising, but not a promise. Sure. But that, so Marshfield isn't joining us, because if, if, if folks see slides that show the different town breakdowns, Marshfield isn't on there because we don't have anything factual to say right now. But I anticipate that, that, that they would be, we will be tracking it each year. Uh, so that, that is an important factor uh, that we'll talk more about, hopefully, as this project moves forward. I was going to say, Superintendent Hickey, we'll certainly be seeing you again in the future as this develops. You want to hear from residents. You, you don't mind them emailing you. Your email is right there on that screen. Oh, I, 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 would, welcome, I would welcome outreach. Uh, you mentioned SouthShoreTechProject.com. Yep. Our OPM does a nice job of updating the site. People who want to do a deep dive into old meetings, minutes, documents. But uh, no, I, 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 would, I would appreciate feedback. Uh, uh, and again, there's a lot going on in the, in the next month. Uh, but uh, certainly as I get into the fiscal 25 budget cycle, and I've got the opportunity to come back to Citroen and talk to advisory and to select board, uh, we'll be talking as much about next year's budget as we will about uh, signaling and raising awareness of, of this building project. But I, I appreciate you uh, having me on to talk about it today, Seth. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Great to see you. Great to see you, too.